Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Best Practices for Board's Response to a Data Breach. My name is Daria, and I am part of the marketing team here at Diligent. Now, before we get started, here are a couple of housekeeping items. The webinar will be about 40 minutes long, and we will have some time at the end for your questions. All attendees are muted, so please feel free to use the GoToWebinar panel on your right-hand side to pose your questions. The webinar is being recorded, and we will make sure to share the recording with everyone within the next 24 hours. <coughs> I'm very happy to be joined today by my colleague Kais Garalbe. Kais is Diligence Business Representative in the Middle East. We also have two very special guests. We have Dr. Ashraf, uh, who is CEO of Hukuma, the Institute for Corporate Governance in the Middle East. And we are happy to welcome Ritva Kassis, the Chartered Secretary and Legal Professional. With that, I will hand over to Kais and our speakers to introduce themselves. Thank you, Daria. So uh, uh, my name is Kais Marabi, and uh, uh, I've been based out of the Middle East, uh, based out of Dubai for the past 25 years. Um, I focused on my career in working with multinational technology businesses that uh, uh, want to expand their presence here in the region. Um, and recently, for the past six years, I've been representing Diligent Corporation uh, and helping the organization expand its footprint in terms of a customer base here in the region, as well as advocating some thought leadership around boards and governance. Uh, Ritva? Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ritva Cassis. I'm actually a chartered secretary, a chartered governance professional, and also ethics and compliance professional. Um, I have about 15 years of experience with listed companies, private and state-owned enterprises. Um, I previously held the positions of Head of Governance, Ethics and Compliance at Adnoc Logistics and I was the Group Company Secretary of DP World. Currently, I manage uh, iAdvise, which is a consultancy firm providing governance and board advisory services. Thank you. Dr. Ashraf? Good morning, everyone. I'm Ashraf Gamal, the CEO of Halkama. Uh, I've been the CEO of Halkama for the last almost uh, seven years. Um, we do uh, governance work for uh, uh, regulators, for companies, for banks, different types of businesses in the region. Uh, we train boards, we advise boards, uh, we do corporate governance assessments. Uh, before that, I was the executive chairman of Egypt Post, the postal authority in Egypt. Uh, before that, I was part of the Central Bank of Egypt. Uh, my life has been corporate governance and, and CSR since maybe 2004, 2005 up till now. I'm very happy to uh, to be here and we are very happy to come to partner with Diligence in this very important webinar. Thank you. Thank you. So um, uh, today's topic that we're going to discuss is related to cybersecurity and the uh, uh, role of the uh, board of directors when it comes to a cybersecurity breach. Um, we are going to cover in today's agenda the key responsibilities of the board before and after a cyber incident. We're going to talk about some of the main building blocks of launching a response plan and the association of the board with it. Uh, we'll cover also uh, how an organization that is under a breach can establish a secure communication channel. And then we will touch also on what are the coordination activities that needs to be done with the law enforcement and regulators uh, in the case of a breach and the associated notifications. And after that, we will open uh, the door for some Q&A from our audience. Um, uh, so, uh, cyber security is becoming a, a, a increasingly more important and uh, uh, taking the attention of organizations across different levels. Um, uh, that's what we're going to talk about today, but before we do so, we would like to first get the audience view on how uh, cyber security is being addressed uh, with its relevance to the board. So, uh, you see in front of you on the screen a question uh, with a number of different uh, uh, options to answer. Uh, so if you don't mind just taking the next 30 seconds to uh, uh, look at that and, and to address it. The question is, how does your board and 
or your company handle cybersecurity? Uh, is it occasionally on the board's agenda as a topic? Is it on the board's agenda at each meeting and part of a risk report? Uh, is it on each agenda tracked with metrics tested uh, with, uh, with proper response plans? Or is it viewed as a responsibility of the executives and key uh, technical experts? Or is it not closely mentioned uh, or monitored by the board of directors? So please go ahead and, and answer. In the meantime, uh, I'd like to get uh, 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 Dr. Ashraf's guess. What do you think is, is most likely to be the uh, most popular answer among the audience? <laughs> Well, actually, I don't want to preempt uh, the, the, the survey, uh, but again, because we, we do a lot of work with boards in the region, and, and part of what we do is we look at the board agenda and the board folders and, and, and topics they discuss on the board and the time allocation for that. So we do have a very clear idea about you know what's really happening on the ground. So I hope that people, when they respond, they are not talking about the ideal world, but talking about reality. You know, in their own companies, their own boards, their own management, and and, and let's see, and then I will share with you uh, what we see in, in, on the ground in, in the companies we deal with. Wonderful, thank you. And Ritza, what do you think? Well, I'm going to just support Dr. Ashraf because I'd, I'd like to see how people will answer um, and I can share my experience, practical experience from being a board secretary for a few years. Um, where this topic existed and how it actually evolved um, say from 2000 2015 onwards and now with the, with the pandemic how it has changed the dynamics of what the board has on its agenda absolutely uh, i can see that there's a lot of development uh, that's happening in this topic and uh, thank you daria for uh, showing uh, uh, the uh, uh, outcome of the uh, poll, as you can see here, there's about 36% of the audience that have responded uh, believe that it's not closely monitored by the board of directors. I personally have guessed that this would be the case, uh, but yeah. I didn't share it earlier. Uh, about 24% view it as the responsibility of executives and key technical experts, which kind of ties along with the, with the previous statement. 0% uh, 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 see it on the agenda. Uh, tracked with metrics and tested response plans, uh, and uh, uh, about 20% uh, say that it's on the board uh, uh, on the board agenda at each meeting and part of a risk report. Uh, another 20% occasionally see it as occasionally on the board's agenda as a topic. So this is quite interesting and sets the stage quite nicely for the uh, uh, scope of the uh, uh, webinar that we have today. So uh, let's share with you some data points uh, that we have about the topic. Um, and about, uh, so first of all, cybersecurity um, uh, or cyber attacks uh, are, are being witnessed almost every 39 seconds around the world. So if you take a view around the world and you, you're tracking every cyber attack that's happening, uh, we're seeing uh, a cyber attack happening in almost every 40 seconds. Uh, the cyber risk is viewed by the World Economic Forum uh, uh, in their uh, 2018 Global Risk Report as one of the top three risks to global stability uh, over the next five years. Uh, and this is adjacent to natural disasters and extreme weather, uh, uh, weather conditions. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, the cost of a data breach uh, can reach up to 6.53 uh, million US dollars. Uh, and uh, uh, it's the second highest globally. So uh, again, if you have a map of the world and you're trying to witness where are the attacks happening, uh, you will see that the Middle East is quite an active region for, for hackers and attackers. And about 20% uh, has been witnessed as an increase in cyber threats or cyber breaches as a result of uh, uh, working remotely from home because the cyber uh, uh, threat landscape is expanded. Uh, in areas that are not under the control of the company, uh, such as the homes of people, and, and that created an increase in vulnerability. Uh, email remains the number one biggest security threat. And in Saudi Arabia, uh, almost one out of 118 emails uh, is a malicious email. So, uh, and, and this is uh, the highest in the region. So it's, it's something that's really quite concerning. 
it drives the region to uh, whether it is the regulators or the government or uh, private sector uh, to pay close attention to cybersecurity threats and, and, and decide how they are going to uh, handle uh, such situations as and when they occur. And there are different ways of uh, uh, looking into it. Uh, but definitely, this is a topic that has uh, eleva elevated itself to the attention of the board. And for this, I'd like to uh, pass uh, uh, the stage to Dr. Ashraf to talk to us a little bit about what's his view about the responsibilities of the board. Doctor? Uh, thank you, please. Uh, again, if, 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 if you go back to uh, the survey results that we just had, uh, in fact, it, it's really, it, it matches with what we expected as well. Um, um, we, we see uh, uh, board packs and, 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 and the agendas for, for the boards, and uh, in many cases that uh, item of cybersecurity is not actually on the agenda of the board at all. So it is, it is perceived in many cases that the board is not really, you know, the one in charge of that. It is more of uh, IT people and technicians, which is uh, technically correct on the technical side, but again, uh, there are other things. The board has to be uh, aware of it. So again, what we thought about is actually having some sort of a checklist, which means every one of you uh, in, in, in the audience, you can use the checklist to check whether your board is on the right track or not regarding cybersecurity. So, so the first item of the checklist is actually, is cyber risk regularly on your board agenda or not? Now, now, as Price mentioned, now you have 20% increase in cyber attacks because of working remotely. And apparently remote working will continue for uh, a long time to come. And not just because of the pandemic, but actually because now it's a very really convenient option for lots of companies, especially those who have you know, board members across different countries and, and continents. So it's much easier for them. So that situation will continue. So the cyber risk has to be an item where it is visible on the agenda of the board and they are discussing it uh, regularly speaking. Second check uh, uh, list uh, point is actually, does the board understand all the threats the company is facing? Now, uh, in, in many cases, you might talk about cybersecurity and cyber risk and so on, but do board members understand what we mean by that? Do they understand what are the issues at stake there? Do they understand what kind of risks the company might be facing because of cyber attacks and how much they've been losing? I mean, Kais was talking about billions of dollars actually of losses happening because of cyber attacks. So, so again, this takes us to the uh, idea of board composition, who is actually on the board, do with this, some of them understand uh, uh, IT and cyber uh, or not? Uh, do we have regular training for the board to understand these things or not? So that's the second item on your checklist. Uh, third item, uh, does the board understand that uh, their accountability in this? So again, on the survey that you that, that we just had, you had again that you know a, a lot of people thinking that this responsibility is for the IT and for the management and for executives, which is okay. But then one of the key elements in governance is actually you can delegate the uh, responsibility. Uh, authority but not a responsibility which means the board remains responsible for whatever happens so you have to understand that if something a lot of major happens in the company the board is liable for this you cannot say it's actually the it department or the head of uh, uh, security here no it is the board of directors so the board have to understand that actually they are liable for whatever happens in, in that uh, uh, matter now uh, do, do you actually understand that the board understand what kind of assets are under threat i just give you one clear example. I mean, last year we had uh, a press release by one of the uh, big German auto makers, and what they said is that they have suffered a, a cyber attack and that cost them 40 million euros. In that press release, what they said is, this is not the first time that the company has been under cyber attack. However, it is the first time this includes financials. What that means is sometimes your, your competitors or others are not looking for money. They are looking for competitive information about you, for maybe patent rights, for uh, projects you are working on, for proposals you are drafting, uh, and, and so on. So, so sometimes you might not even feel that you have been hacked or you have been attacked. So this is a key element for the world to understand that you do have assets other than money that other people might be uh, looking for. Now, did actually your board ensure that the company addresses cybersecurity in the right way and the vulnerabilities that you have 
and the risk that you have dealing with third parties. In some cases, you know, all companies, of course, deal with suppliers, with third parties, with consultants, with experts. Now, sometimes, of course, they have to sign NDA, and, and then you start sharing documents with them. Now, these documents are at risk if they don't have the right systems as well. So it is not only about you having the right system to, to protect your, your data and information and, and, and so on, but it's also when you hand some of this information to third parties, I have to make sure that they do have the right systems in place to protect that sort of information I'm giving them. And then finally, does the board actually review and approve cybersecurity policies and procedures? So yes, the management is in charge of the implementation, but the board has to ask all the right questions and we have to understand the policy and we have to feel comfortable that it is enough to protect our assets in the company and we are covered. Again, the management might have so many things to handle, but the board looks at the strategic issues. One of that is risk and one of that now is cyber security so this very brief checklist will tell you whether your company is sort of protected or is it the right track or maybe you need to improve a few things please thank you uh, Dr. Ashraf. i'd like to add uh, a few comments as, as as an example of uh, what diligent is doing in in this area uh, because we really believe that it's a best practice and and we take the extra mile to make sure uh, that we're looking at cybersecurity in the best possible way. For the audience, uh, Diligent uh, secures communication of, uh, of, uh, uh, and of board material for the board of directors and automates the board-related processes. So all the information related to boards of all of our 19,000 customers globally uh, is running within our secured environments. And the company has to take extreme measures in order to protect this data because this is the bread and butter of the company. So uh, 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 from the executive management and below, uh, we do a lot of different things related to uh, uh, cybersecurity. So we have the technical experts that are uh, leaders in this space globally that are working with us to ensure that our environment is quite secured. We have established policies and procedures to make sure that our uh, uh, employees are educated and uh, uh, they are aware of how to protect the organization's assets from cyber threats. Uh, we have controls in place to ensure that data uh, of our customers cannot be accessed by anybody. And at the same time, we run our uh, regular penetration testing using third parties to ensure that the environment is well protected. Um, uh, on top of that, uh, the board uh, uh, assumed responsibility of the security uh, topic. It became a fixed agenda item uh, uh, on the board meetings, which happen quarterly. Uh, there is a predefined uh, uh, response plan to each security threat that involves people from the board and, and, and the executive management and different uh, uh, organ uh, divisions within the organization. Uh, and there is a clear sense of accountability uh, related to uh, uh, cyber breaches uh, that is on the board level. Uh, in addition to that, these response plans are being exercised thoroughly uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, if and when a cybersecurity threat uh, happens, we are prepared to know how to handle it in the best possible way and to minimize the breach and, 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 uh, and the damage associated with that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about, the, uh, uh, about launching a response plan and, and how an organization can protect itself uh, by being prepared for something like this. So the first thing that the organization should do is to stop the breach. And to stop the breach, you need a combination of uh, security uh, solutions that are deployed, both physical and virtual security solutions that are deployed within the organization. You need policies and procedures to be implemented to ensure uh, that uh, when something like this happens, how can the organization protect itself and continue its operation while it is uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the incident? So how can you isolate the incident, stop it, and then continue your operation? Uh, and then you need to activate your response team. And the response team, typically, we see different skill sets and areas of focus from the organization. So legal has to be involved, risk and compliance need to be involved, uh, information security and their expertise is essential, and both internal and external communication and investor relations uh, need to be involved because there's a lot of communication that needs to happen to different stakeholders, both internal and external. And in some cases, we see organizations that rely on third party experts in security to help them address uh, and navigate uh, this turbulent uh, uh, situation. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, uh, the uh, response plan, uh, part of the response plan is to establish communication me measures or uh, communication channels that enables you to speak uh, comfortably with your staff, your regulator, the police, customers, clients, partners, and suppliers, and even shareholders and investors, and eventually the market and the media. So the communication around the incident, depending whether you're a public listed company or private or government related, needs to be addressed in a proper way. And while you're preparing for this communication, you need a secured environment to be able to do that preparation. So we'll talk about that in, in the next slide. And then, uh, you know, the board needs to let the crisis response team do its job. Uh, so the board should maintain some level of distance while monitoring the situation to let the experts take their job. And at some point, they may consider seeking or soliciting external reinforcement if the internal resources are struggling with the attack. And in, in some cases, uh, you know, if the internal resources are struggling, it doesn't mean that you are uh, underperforming. It just simply means that you're dealing with something that is new and you might need to reach out to get some external help in order to help you address it in the fastest way. So, so uh, when it comes to security uh, breaches, there are three things that organizations would try to uh, uh, achieve. One is how you can detect the threat as fast as possible. The second is how you can analyze the threat so that you know how to respond to it as fast as possible. And then third, how you can respond to the threat in the fast, fastest possible manner. Dr. Ashraf, you wanted to add any comments on this before we move on? Oh, well, actually, I think the best one to, who can add to this actually is Ritva. Ritva has uh, considerable experience in, in that area. So if, if Ritva can share with us her own uh, insights uh, and input on that, that, that would be great. Ritva? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ashraf. I think from my perspective and what I have seen in, in, in practice, the, t the key elements is that the rapid response plan is activated automatically that it is properly detailed. It is very important that it is defined and structured to handle you know, any cyber threat or, or any breach, because it will allow the teams on, you know, on the ground to actually, as uh, Qais had said, to detect and identify, find a quick solutions to minimize the damage and to stop it, and also to actually stop any subsequent attacks that could happen. You know, the, you know, the attack you want is like uh, an earthquake. You know, you have those repercussions afterwards. So the the skills of the response team are very are key. Talking about communication, um, as we said, when you know ransomware, malware, whenever they hit a company, they spread so fast and they can cause catastrophic damage. Everybody knows that. It could actually compromise your communication plans. So the response team needs to have in place a parallel secure communication um, routes that they can use to communicate with the key stakeholders, whether it's executive management, board, uh, etc., to make sure that they, that they can speak to each other um, in a secure environment without any further risks of breaches. So, and on top of that, it's not just the secure channel, it is also to have details of how to communicate and what to communicate to each stakeholder at the right time. So the what, how and when are key elements to be in that response plan, because when the team is dealing, it's chaos. It is um, high, you know, it's high pressure, it's fast paced. So having a clear guideline is critical for them to get things done, you know, um, in a sequence and, and on time. Another one is I've seen an example where an attack has actually put a whole company to a halt. This is where business continuity triggers. There need to be proper discussions between you know, the business continuity team and the IT security team who are actually the technical people who are managing it. And also with the executive, uh, you know, overview of, of the whole plan. Because if that happens, if, if you're a bank or if you are a, um, you know, a, a health provider or, you know, any other type where you need to make sure that your services are 
you know, not interrupted, business continuity, mm -hmm. they cannot be, you know, handled in silos. They need to be speaking to each other. Uh, I, if I can actually, if I can add to this, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, as as uh, you can see, the process of uh, a response uh, is is a very complicated one. It's um, uh, you know, it's it's multidimensional. Uh, so part of the team will be you know stopping the, the the damage which is happening. Another team will be handling you know uh, things on the ground uh, and moving forward. Another team will be taking care. To make sure that business is going almost as usual so that it doesn't dis disrupt our our operations and so on uh and, and again communication plan has to be very extensive so so that's why we say the board has to be aware there is a system in place and that system is well uh, drafted it's actually tried uh, there was rehearsal on that we made sure that the system is is working perfectly to achieve our objectives in, 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 in the right way, if you like. So, so that's why, despite that you have many operational issues there, but that whole strategy of how to handle, you know, a breach or a risk, a uh, cybersecurity happening, has to be approved by the board, and the board has to be in charge. Uh, even sometimes, some of the board members, if you talk about high-level sort of breaches, you might find the chairman of the board or one of the board members is actually talking to the media, explaining certain things, or comforting some of the business partners or the clients or the government sometimes in certain cases and so on. So that's why that system doesn't really succeed haphazardly. It succeeds only if there was a very good plan, and that plan is thoroughly analyzed, presented to the board, discussed by the board, approved by the board. Part of that is what was talking, disclosure policy. Who will talk about what exactly, what information we can give, and who's authorized to give out that information. So the last thing you'd like to see happening is when you have something like this, a chaotic situation in the company where you know we have no idea what to do and what to say and so on because maybe one wrong uh, information going out to the public might destroy value for the company so but but then handling try it will actually create value and reassure the partners that we are in, in control yes we have an issue but then we are controlling it and we have a plan to handle that so again the board comes as really you know, uh, the comfort for the management and supporting for the management to stand by them in this time of crisis. This is no time to blame who is responsible for that, but it's time to work together as management and board to make sure that we, uh, you know, pass the crisis with the lowest sort of disruption and, 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 and uh, losses to us and to our business partners as well. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, uh, coincidentally, uh, last night I had dinner with a chairman of an organization uh, here in the UAE who has recently experienced a ransomware attack. Uh, and it just it was just a pure coincidence. Uh, and we started talking about the topic of cybersecurity and the involvement of the board. And he was saying that um, uh, the organization had a certain level of preparation uh, and had uh, response plans in place and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, you know they they got exposed to this uh, attack, but uh, but there was a strong belief that because of the preparation that they had, they were able to reduce the ransom value to less than ten percent of what was originally uh, requested. Right, and and in, in in such a time, the only leverage that you have is how prepared you are for such a situation. So, although that seemed like a great achievement in a difficult time. Uh, uh, the board immediately requested the organization to revamp their entire uh, 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 outlook into security from the ground up to make sure that if something like this happens again, they don't even have to pay that uh, uh, less than 10% and, and, and they need to be uh, well protected for that organization. But definitely preparation in, in, in its worst fashion could, could at least help uh, minimize the impact uh, to the organization. Um, and, and, and part of what uh, I heard from you, Dr. Ashraf, and from uh, Ritva, uh, and our belief as well, is that communication is at the heart of all of this. So let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, how you can establish secure communication channels uh, for, uh, for handling a security uh, breach. Uh, uh, so, no doubt, in, in, in such a situation, like you said, Dr. Ashraf, it can get chaotic, it can get uh, uh, difficult to control how things move uh, forward. Uh, uh, when there is a security breach, leaders must have the right information at their fingertips, and, and the organization needs to have uh, different methods in place to ensure 
that uh, uh, this information is accessible by the authorized people and therefore it needs to be in some sort of a centralized location uh, uh, for the response plan to live uh, and the different response uh, uh, rapid response team members to, uh, to communicate and collaborate. Uh, it must be secured and accessible remotely uh, by the board members and the management. And then there needs to be a proper communication infrastructure that uh, enables uh, uh, the flow of communication uh, to be able to notify directors and both internal and external stakeholders on a need to know basis. Um, and, and there needs to be some sort of a secured messaging environment to enable uh, real-time communication uh, for updating documents and for communicating with short messages to make sure that uh, uh, you know, there's, there's proper collaboration for the board and the executive management uh, and the rapid response team to be able to communicate fast, to be able to address the three main things uh, uh, that are of urgency in such a situation, which is to be able to detect faster, to analyze faster, and to be able to respond faster to a cyber threat. Having said so, uh, there needs to be uh, some collaboration and coordination with external authorities, such as the law enforcement agencies, as well as the uh, regulators. So uh, uh, I'll leave this uh, part to our, our expert Redva, who has a depth of experience and knowledge in the uh, uh, in the local laws and and what can be done in this uh, space. So Redva, over to you. Thank you, Kais. I think the key element to start with is that how a company manages um, a data breach and um, its obligations towards the market, the regulator, et cetera, stems from your regulatory landscape. If we tar if now we're talking the, the region, um, UAE in particular, there are no comprehensive data protection um, laws in the UAE. There are no mandatory requirements to report data breaches yet. So, what is happening is that the the government has already launched a national cybersecurity strategy, which actually happened in 2019, where it aims at basically creating this safe um, and strong infrastructure in the country. And one of the key pillars includes implementing a legal and you know uh, a comprehensive um, legal and regulatory framework. So consolidation of laws, um, plans. Um, regulations, et cetera, that will govern these type of um, incidents. So if they were also what they're looking at is that they will be also establishing a robust national cyber incident response plan. So they are pushing the country and the infrastructure to be aligned with the types of laws and regulations that you'll find in the US or under the EU directives or you know all the other um, advanced uh, jurisdictions. But what we do have, there, there are an array of laws that you can look at in, you know, independently. Each one of them covers a topic. You have multiple regulators in the country. So, for example, um, you're looking at the Telecom uh, Regulatory Authority, TRA. Um, the central bank is considered as a regulator in, in that sense, especially for the financial institutions. So TRA for the telecom institutions, the Ministry of Health for the um, health industry. Um, so each one of them covers one. Um, the one law that we ha that, is, that exists now is um, law number five of 2012, which is uh, for combating cybercrime. Everybody likes to um, refer to it as cybercrime law. But in my experience, the federal entities, you know, the, the government-owned companies, I've worked mostly for state-owned enterprises, whether acting um, as an independent entity or, or not, they have very strict regulations, actually, that cover them. So if you look at the um, Information Assurance Standards, um, NESA regulations, the ISR regulations in Dubai and SEMA regulations, but they mostly target um, federal agencies to protect national assets. They are very detailed, um, follow the international best practices, ISO and the like. They are very clear in identifying accountabilities and responsibilities. And you will find in those that the responsibility 
is put on the board of directors, mm -hmm. regardless of how they will delegate, which is something we will cover in the in the next slide. Um, and what could happen as well is that um, the entities that have been subject to a breach and in within their internal investigations they were able to gather the the data the evidence and secure it in the proper ways which are internationally identified that would be admissible in the court of law they could seek law enforcement assistance so the police may enforce and assist later on also you know enforcing criminal sanctions against certain violations but to do that obviously each company needs to have as we said the right response plans investigative skills the technical skills to manage and collect everything that they can so that they can hand it over to the law enforcement who would then um, you know assist um, moving forward if those reach courts um, the perpetrators could be um, sanctioned under the relevant laws and penalties actually could include imprisonment and financial fines. The financial fines could reach up to 2 million dirhams, imprisonment in six months, and obviously it, it, it is um, a rather, it's, um, actually it, it depends on the severity and the, and the impact of, of that cyber attack. Uh, you know, I'm sure the court would look at it uh, differently. Another point I wanted to, um, I would like, I wanted to highlight is talking about the local initiative uh, to build a strong cybersecurity landscape environment. Is that there is also a collaboration in the, you know, in in the region for all countries to to work together um, to combat cyber um, cyber attacks and build a very strong um, information technology slash security infrastructure. Thank you, Rudva. That's uh, very insightful and clearly uh, 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 a great point to, uh, to focus on is the level of the penalties that are imposed on, on boards uh, and individuals within the board uh, uh, is something that uh, requires them to take uh, uh, proper uh, action on this. Um, uh, great, so I think we've, we've covered uh, uh, more or less the topics of the uh, uh, agenda. We'd like to summarize this uh, in, in a few bullet points uh, uh, or takeaways uh, for the audience to, uh, to look at. Uh, so uh, let's take the first one. Uh, understanding the cyber uh, threats are growing. This is the Kind of the first point that we wanted to bring uh, the audience attention to it. It is growing. Uh, if you remember in one of the slides we mentioned that the cost of a data breach is 6.5 million US dollars here in the region. I remember a few years ago looking at the same number and it was 3.5 million. So no doubt it's becoming more costly for organizations to be vulnerable to cyber threats and, uh, uh, and the frequency it, the, the cyber threat landscape is growing and it's expanding because businesses are going more digital. Uh, people are working more from home, so they're, they're expanded beyond the control of the network of the organization. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And this requires a different way of thinking towards cyber, cyber threats. Uh, understanding the personal liability risk, risk we've, we've talked about that, and it's really crucial to, for boards to understand that they need to take accountability and they need to accept responsibility for, for cybersecurity. And as a result of that, uh, uh, they may take some of the measures that has been, uh, has been recommended in this uh, webinar uh, or even more to ensure uh, that uh, they are managing this accountability in the best possible way. Yeah, if I may add here, Kais, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah. is that from as a company secretary and as a governance professional, you start by the directors have a fiduciary duties. And one of the key fiduciary duties is to protect the assets of the company. A cyber attack is an attack against the assets of the company. Hence, if the directors fail to ensure that there are adequate measures to protect the assets of the company, hence breaching a, a key risk element, then they are in breach of their fiduciary duties, hence personally liable. And one area, every um, company secretary or a governance professional to, to 
ensure that the attention is brought to the board and the board takes it very seriously in to to have that agenda item on you know on their agenda as a regular item is to make sure that the board members understand the legal implications the uh, implications of them breaching their fiduciary duties in addition to all the financial and business continuity consequences on the company as a whole they can end up in jail there are individual penalties against the directors yeah. absolutely and i think i think Faiz, also one of the key elements there is if the board is not getting enough information about the subject they have to ask these questions to the management so sometimes the management will focus on the report on financials, you know, achievements and stuff like that, uh, things that they are happy with. But then if the board does not feel comfortable, they're not getting enough information about cybersecurity or any other risk, they have to ask the question to say, what about this? How are you handling this? What's the plan here? Uh, what if this right. thing happened? And so on. So they need to ask this question because as, as uh, 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 was saying, they are liable into the day. It is really their responsibility. If something major happens, you cannot, the company might sack the head of, of, of security in the company or IT uh, security or whatever, but then liable is the board of directors to the external parties and to the uh, shareholders and regulators as well. You cannot say the IT uh, team didn't do the job. It's actually you who didn't do the job, not, not the other people. Absolutely. So while uh, while uh, delegating the responsibility, they need to challenge uh, the organization or the executive management to make sure that the right measures are in place. And for this to happen, for this to happen, we're seeing a lot of directors want to educate themselves on the topic of security, and they want to understand, you know, how they can ask the right questions around this topic. And even boards and chairmen start to look at the, the board composition and how they can have some technical or uh, some expertise around cybersecurity or uh, information technology that sits on the board so that uh, you're able to stimulate the right uh, conversation topics uh, uh, around this area. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, another point that we want to mention is that, you know, boards need to consider sometimes also uh, cybersecurity insurance uh, for both themselves and for uh, the organization. So, I know that Ritva has uh, a couple of things to talk about this, so uh, I'll ask you, Ritva, what do you think? No, it, it, it is um, a matter that we, we've discussed before that cybersecurity insurance is, is a new type of insurance available in the market. Um, I see it in twofold. One, because it is very restrictive. It forces the companies to ensure that they have all what we call adequate measures in place so that they qualify to actually be able to secure this type of insurance. Now, to the extent it actually might cover a company all depends on, on the provider. Um, it is not very comprehensive like director's liabilities still, um, but it is worthwhile considering it, um, you know, as a, as a type of insurance for the company. Absolutely. And, and then in, ensuring a cybersecurity uh, uh, is a standard agenda item uh, we kept on mentioning this throughout the uh, uh, the discussion of today. It's really important. It's the, it's the first step towards bringing focus on this topic and, and some of the different areas uh, to uh, deep dive into within this agenda item is, you know, looking at a cyber security risk assessment and understanding what is the current cyber security framework, what are the policies in place, what needs to be tweaked and, and, and improved. Uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, looking at a response plan uh, in case of a cyber threat, and and uh, look at ways to measure how 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 this response plan is is uh, uh, is effective. Uh, it needs to be regularly uh, regularly reviewed. It needs to be updated and stress tested. So, so that's really essential. Uh, uh, this uh, this was a summary of the different takeaways to think about uh, uh, for the audience uh, from this webinar. Um, uh, I'll take a stop here. I think we've reached the end of the content that we wanted to share with the audience. And uh, uh, Daria, back to you uh, for the uh, remaining uh, time. Thank you all so much. Uh, now, before we uh, get started with the Q&A, there is another poll on your screens running on the background. So please make sure to participate. And now the first question is, do you think we have enough and up-to-date regulations in place to protect shareholders when it comes to cybersecurity? And this person uh, refers specifically to UAE and GCC in general. 
the Sritva wants to take it. Dr. Ashraf, would you have a view on this? Uh, I, I think it's a legal question, so I think Sritva would be the best one to answer based on the regulations. Uh, and do, you, do we have laws and regulations to protect shareholders against the losses caused by cyber security or cyber attacks? Is this actually a thing which is covered, Sritva? Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm a lawyer, but um, I've, I have uh, some level of uh, information around this. As I've, as I've said uh, previously, is that there isn't a very comprehensive law in, in, in the region that actually provides this cover. These matters are dealt with under different other types of laws, um, depending on whether uh, the company has secured evidence, um, data, they have solicited maybe external expert to help them um, manage the incident and, and create a, a proper case, etc. They can they can go after perpetrators, um, you know, under the penal code, under the telecommunications um, regulations, um, etc. But there isn't one particular um, law that actually provides that, unlike what we see, um, like in 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 the EU or in the US, where you have a specific clause in black and white where it forces the company to act in a in a certain manner and compensate its customers and or you know the losses how they deal with shareholders minority shareholders etc. Um, unfortunately, I do not have further information on this topic um, from a local perspective. And uh, we have uh, time for one last question. What training and support should be offered to directors, do you think? Um, in terms of training and information, number one is to, to get them to understand the impact on them as, pers as individuals, so the personal liability stemming from starting by breaching their fiduciary duties. Um, giving them also, depending also on the industry that they are, they operate in, give them a high level technical um, training on the impact and how it could happen. And the training is not just for board members, it's actually for the whole company, because the number one reason of security breaches are individuals. It's people like you and me sitting behind our desk, opening emails and attachments we're not supposed to, giving an open door. So the awareness of the board members and the rest of, of the employees in the company on what phishing is, what malware is, what ransomware is, what forms it can take, how you could potentially look into it. And if you suspect your email has an attachment that you haven't solicited, etc., don't open it, call you know, the experts for them to see. Um, and if the board members, they are members of a, a highly regulated entity or they are in an industry like telecom or IT, like diligent, for example, I would expect to have at least one board member who is tech savvy, who has information security, um, you know, background whereby the board members can actually learn from, from each other as well. So we start from the governance slash legal li personal liabilities, which makes them listen in, gen in, in essence. And then you look into financial aspects, damages, how far it can go, um, the damage to the bottom line of the company, it's the, the massive reputational risk and how it can, it can be mitigated. So the board member needs to have this at least once a year. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ritva. I'd like to add uh, a couple of more points that uh, I thought about as you were talking, and then I'll pass it to Dr. Ashraf for a, a final uh, view on the on the question. I think uh, boards are becoming more and more encouraged to solicit external uh, uh, consultants to give them regular updates about the threat landscape, about the uh, uh, measures and the responsibilities of the board and what they need to uh, take. And I think uh, also uh, what you rightfully said with regards to the composition of the board, uh, it's important to have somebody who's experienced who's who, in this topic that's continuously uh, uh, provoking the discussion about this topic and what the organization needs to do. Dr. Ashraf? 
Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Ritra and, and, and you said, guys. Uh, what I add to this actually, when we approach boards of directors and that, uh, what we uh, emphasize is number one, the fiduciary responsibility that they do have. So they are uh, responsible to protect the assets of the company, uh, and they are also uh, 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 responsible for the rights of the stakeholders. So because sometimes companies do have data coming from their own partners and suppliers. So actually, other companies might be damaged because of our lack of cybersecurity. So again, we are liable for that. So we have to understand this. But also, we, we are, are saying that you don't really need to be you know, IT savvy or something, but you have to understand the key issues. So I think regular uh, updates to the board of what are the risks, what are the issues, what kind of you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, breaches we're talking about, what kind of damage we're talking about. This is very important. And then also because you know, you know, the board you have sometimes information security committee or you have audit committee taking care of that. So what we say is. Uh, there is, you know, something which which, which is uh, IT governance and audits. You have to understand the fundamentals of this. Again, you don't need to be an expert, but you have to know what is it that you are looking for. So when you have an audit committee looking at, you know, audit reports coming about their IT uh, information technology and, 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 and systems, we have to understand what we're asking about. And that's why in two weeks' time, we're having actually a course focusing on this from a high level of, you know, the board and the top management, what is it that you have to understand? It doesn't end up you being an expert in IT cyber, cyber security or IT security, but then you have to know the issues. So again, even as as, as you said, guys, if, if I'm using a third party for that, but I have to understand the fundamentals. So I need to be guiding the third party to my own interest, not their own interest in that respect. So so this is really, I think, a key a key element. But again, as we said at the beginning, it all starts from the board of directors. So you can literally leave all this thing, the management will take care of it. I have to ask the right questions. I have to make sure we have the right frameworks in place. I have to make sure that it's being tested. And, and as Rick said, it is then uh, each one of the company who have to understand, you know, how if the company can be damaged from his or her own side by a wrong email or a wrong attachment or, or whatever it is. So I, again, it's really it's it's uh, it's it's everyone's job. But then the board has to make sure that it is happening correct because ultimately they are liable for whatever happens in the company at the end of the day. Guys. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you, Ritva. Uh, I believe uh, we have reached to the end of uh, today's webinar. And also thank you to the audience for uh, uh, being with us throughout this time. I think we have over 50 attendees that uh, stuck with us all the way to the end. We hope that you found the content relevant and of value. Um, uh, Diligent uh, is, is, is very experienced in this domain and we can advocate a lot of thought leadership on, on this topic. If you're interested in hearing more about what we can help you with uh, in this uh, in this area with regards to the board's responsibilities and their, their, the, the, the different tools that they can use in order to uh, be able to handle such situations in the most effective way, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. I know that uh, Dr. Ashraf and Haukam have an, uh, uh, an extensive level of expertise also in this area, so please feel free to communicate with us and to reach out to us if you would like uh, to hear more about this topic. Uh, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email uh, with the recording of the uh, webinar, uh, and, and please uh, feel free to communicate with us if you would like to keep the conversation going. So thank you from my side. Again, thanks a lot for everybody, uh, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Dario, for organizing this event. Thank you all so much, and uh, we hope you found the discussion valuable and insightful, and have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank See you. you in other events.